Hello and welcome to my channel, Dave Doesn't Know. Thanks for tuning in. It's a very exciting day for me. I'm launching my channel for the first time. Well, what have I got for you? Well, after years of seeing everyone else go through the things that they're passionate about, uploading loads of content and me subscribing and liking everyone else's videos, I thought that I would try it myself. Well, I'm going to delve into the world of conspiracies and the absurdity of it. We're not just conspiracies. I'm talking about myths and creations and all things that are wrong in the world. Certainly things like this. Definitely not a flat earther. So I'm starting off today with an absolute belter. Sit back, grab yourself your usual beverage, kick back in your comfortable shoes, wear your pajamas if you want, be naked, I don't care. Just enjoy this video. I'm gonna take you on this amazing journey. I hope you enjoy it. This is Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, the United States of America. Home to the Minuteman Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Intercontinental, sounds a bit exotic, doesn't it? It just basically means it can blow you off the face of the earth wherever you are in the world. Hostilities between the Soviet bloc and Western countries was rife. Pointing nuclear weapons one way, pointing nuclear weapons the other way. Who's got the biggest one? Who can destroy each other first? It's pretty much the Cold War summed up in one sentence. The year was 1967. In the Launch Control Centre, the LCC, Robert Salas and his men were working hard on the missiles. I don't know, maybe polishing the ends of them or, you know, checking the ignitions were okay. Whatever they do down in missile silos during a Cold War standoff. During the evening of March the 16th, the security detail were carrying out their usual patrols when something strange occurred. Robert Salas was a missile control commander. Here, in his own words in 2005, on his little road shows, he explained what happened March. that night. And I've got a question mark here. Um, two months ago, I would have put March 16th, but um, not now. Okay. So, first thing happened, uh, I, I get a call uh, early in the morning. I believe it was early, I believe it was dark, and my commander had uh, woken up from his uh, his rest period. We, we shared rest periods in that little cot you saw. Um, and he says uh, some of the guards and himself have been observing uh, white lights uh, just traveling around the sky in strange ways, uh, um, and he couldn't explain them. They, uh, they didn't seem to be aircraft, and uh, uh, they were acting very strangely. And I, I didn't think much of it, honestly, did not think much of it at the time. I, I was probably reading a, a novel or something, as I usually did. and. Uh, basically told him to call me back when something more interesting happened. And then <laughs> five minutes later, uh, he did call back, and he, this time he started to scream into the telephone. He was yelling, screaming, uh, that he was uh, seeing a, a glowing red object hovering outside the front gate. Um, uh, and he wanted me to tell him what to do. Um, <laughs> uh, I told him to make sure he had all the guards out there, their weapons drawn, and uh, make sure the perimeter fence was secured, basically. Uh, I didn't know what else to tell him. Calls backwards and forth. The alarm was raised. People were panicking. There were lights in the night sky. Security data were panicking. They were told to draw their weapons. One security guard was quoted as, I don't really think they'll be effective, boss. Here is Robert Salas again, in his own words, to explain what happened afterwards. Yep, he hung up the phone. Uh, and I went to wake up my commander, Fred Meinwald, and as I was telling him about the phone calls, our missiles started shutting down. And when they shut down, we get large klaxons, horns going off, and uh, we get a lot of lights coming up on that, uh, on that display panel. So bing, 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 one at a time. Uh, I recall Initially, I recall that uh, all, all 10 of my missiles shut down. Uh, Fred Meyerwald had a, had a different uh, recollection. He thought it was more like eight. But they uh, certainly, most of them shut down. Uh, missiles went into what's called a no-go condition. And what we do when, when anything like that happened, by the way, no, nothing like that ever did happen, except that one night. I was there for three years. Uh, 
we would lose a missile at times from uh, for various reasons, uh, but never more than one. Uh, these these missiles are in, are independent. They have independent power systems. They have independent generators, and uh, they're not interconnected such that uh, they would all shut down at the same time. Uh, so the missiles went no-go, meaning they could not be launched. Um, we immediately queried, uh, we have a query system where it told us essentially what the problem was. It was uh, had to do with guidance and control system failure. Uh, we reported the command post. Um, and at this point, I recall vividly, and I want to emphasize that, <laughs> I recall vividly my commander turning around and, and saying the same thing happened at another flight. And I believe he said echo flight. Um, but that was a clear recollection. So that is the reason uh, when we wrote this book that uh, I thought that uh, the echo flight and the Oscar flight both went down the same morning. Uh, but I'll tell you why I've, I've changed my mind about that. Um, so the next next thing that happened is um, I, I get back on the horn and, and talk to my flight security controller, the main guard upstairs, and ask him about what the situation is up there because uh, at this point we don't know if we're under an attack or not. Again, this is 1967 and, uh, and we certainly could have been under attack, I suppose. So, um, but he said that everything was all clear, that the object, whatever it was, had flown off, uh, and uh, everything was okay. So um, we waited for our, our replacements to come that morning, and then I went up there and confronted the security flight controller of the guard and uh, made sure that there was no hanky-panky, that he was telling the truth, and he certainly assured me that he was, and I, I, I did believe him. I, Look how vulnerable the U.S. were at that moment. I believe the public has a right to know uh, about the facts and implications of these incidents. Um, significance. Well, this is my own impression, and it's just my own opinion that uh, the ET, ET wanted to send us a message about nuclear weapons. Uh, the message, and uh, we heard this uh, message back in, I don't know how, how many of you saw uh, the day the Earth stood still, but we heard this same message there. Humankind and Earth is headed for annihilation unless we collectively disarm our nuclear weapons. Uh, clearly, we're not succeeding, if you read the paper. That's about it. Thank you for your attention. The word UFO was mentioned. Unidentified flying object. No one said the word spaceship or flying saucer. But something that night disabled and disarmed eight of the ten missiles. That is completely unanswered. All the evidence is eyewitness accounts. Why would that many people make something up? And at this day and age, people would have come forward by now to say it was all a hoax. It's never been debunked. And Robert Salas still travels about the country to this day talking about his experiences. Let me know your thoughts and comments on this one. I definitely think this needs a part two. There's so much more to this than meets the eye. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. That's the first time I've ever said that. That's exciting mm -hmm. itself. Thank you and join me next week for yet more myths, conspiracies and something a little bit absurd. I'm Dave. Does Dave know? Not this time.